So the plan for this evening is we're going to have a short astronomy update done by our volunteer, John Emsworth, who is part of the NASA education team. All right, and tonight I'm just going to go through a, a recent story with Oumuamua. That's the name of it. Interstellar Visitor. What is this thing? Well, on October 19th of last year, so this is hot off the presses, <laughs> uh, University of Hawaii's Pan-STARRS telescope detected a new object. Now, it's doing that all the time. It's finding asteroids and rocks and wandering things. And initially, because of its really strange orbit coming from above the solar system and through, they figured that's probably a comet. So they gave it this designation with a C in front. And then they took really good images of that and didn't see any tail or any gassy coma around it. And it was, it was about its closest point to the sun then, so it should have looked like a comet. So they reclassified it with an A. And it's an asteroid now, all right. Um, Rob Work at, uh, confirmed this uh, observation. They started getting more information. They figured out its orbit, its speed, its size. Initially, it looked like it was about something roughly 400 meters in size. So uh, a thousand, a little more, a thousand feet. It's not that huge, but moving very fast for something in the solar system, 25 plus kilometers per second. And right away, they knew this was too fast to have come from inside the solar system, and it isn't going to stay here. It's, it has enough velocity to leave and go back out into interstellar space. Here is a picture, an early picture of it from October 28th. It's a little dot in the center, and it's moving so quickly that as the telescope <laughs> tracked it, the stars in the background appear as streaks of light. This is just what happens when you're trying to follow your kid around in the backyard <laughs> with your iPhone. And they found that they'd already missed the two closest approach times. Uh, it was closest to the sun, September 9th, and closest to the Earth, October 14th, at about 60 times the Earth-Moon distance, which is on interstellar scales. That's close. That's really, that's close. It was close enough uh, to the sun that it really changed direction quite dramatically. It, it got a little boost from the sun. It actually got a gravity assist and sped up to 44 kilometers per second. That's really quick. Uh, so here's its orbit, a little animation of it coming in and, oh, I tried to get the Earth and I missed. <laughs> <laughs> and out it goes. No! No, <laughs> yeah, you don't want this to hit the Earth. That would, uh, we, we saw what happened in Russia just recently, and that was, that, that was enough with window breaking and everything. Um, extrapolating backwards, they saw that it came from roughly the direction of the constellation of Lyra, which has the bright star Vega in it. Uh, this is from above the plane of our solar system, and it's now heading towards the constellation Pegasus, and it's our first known interstellar visitor. We're sure there's been a lot of them, we just have not confirmed that before. But here's where it gets strange. Um, because it's the first interstellar object, we have a new designation. It's not a C, it's not an A, it's an I now. It's uh, one, um, sorry, yeah, one L. Is that right? No, one I for interstellar. I, I have font problems here. It is dark reddish in color. And as they looked at it more, they saw that it changes brightness 10 to 1, 10 times brighter every 7.3 hours to its dimmest time in every 7.3 hours. And they figured out that it's about 800 feet long and 100 feet wide. So the initial size of snow is a little too big. And <coughs> the name Oumuamua means scout, which means reaching out for, and Mua means first or in advance of, and since it's coming from so far away, they doubled that, so Oumuamua. Um, this is an artist's famous picture now, artist's rendition of what it might look like. That is a long, skinny rock. And of course, right away people went, well, that kind of looks like it might not be a rock. It could be an interstellar spaceship. Uh, which brought some science fiction enthusiasts like me back to Arthur C. Clarke's book, Rendezvous with Rama. 
One of my favorite, actually. And because I like that book so much, I actually enjoyed Star Trek The Motion Picture. So, anyways. Oh, sorry. Um, so, we turned SETI telescopes on it, looking to see if it was putting out some little radio beacon. And uh, we were pretty confident that down to something as weak as 0 0.08 watts, there are no radio signals coming from it. We are still watching it from Green Bank as it leaves. Uh, its color is typical of asteroids that have been on space, so it matches what we would expect of a rock. And it's tumbling kind of at an end-over-end way. If you had it rotating like this, you could get artificial gravity but it's not even enough for any significant artificial gravity, and it's a really crazy tumble. Um, so probably not a spacecraft, I'm sorry. Um, uh, it's going to leave the solar system being beyond kind of what we believe is the bow shock uh, of the heliosphere, uh, probably about 20,000 years, but it's moving away fast. Um, we have discussed sending a probe out to it to just see what uh, whether it has any cool discoveries or chemical things to look at. Um, we've looked at ju using Jupiter as a slingshot or seal sails or something like that. Um, but it's uh, pretty expensive and uh, every hour we don't build something, it's really getting uh, away from us fast. So the discussion now is, that, well, maybe we should build some things that can react quickly and get out to the next one. You know, we've got these all-sky surveys going, looking at the sky. We're going to catch more of these. If we found one, we're going to find more. And maybe that's a good way to spend some money, is to be ready for the next, meet it, get some pictures, get, get a sample of it. Who knows? Um, all right, that's all I have on this interstellar visitor. Any questions? <laughs> yes. I, it probably formed just like asteroids do here, uh, but it got slung out of its solar system, gravitational interactions between planets, shuffling things around, maybe a younger solar system. Uh, how it got to, to be that long and skinny? That's a good question, because we don't really have anything that long and skinny in our solar system. Yeah. It's our first confirmed thing out of the solar system. And it's, and it's got a really weird shape. That is a good point, yeah. Mysteries to uncover. All right, want to switch PowerPoints? And we'll switch the microphone up here. So I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Sherilyn Morrow here to the observatory. We've been long, long time colleagues, and she has definitely been a mentor to me in my career. Her background is that she years ago was here in Colorado and got her PhD at the University of Colorado in Boulder and then worked at NCAR doing research in solar physics and then went on to be a postdoctoral research scientist at Cambridge. And then she went all over the place doing all kinds of interesting adventures um, and is one of the foremost people in doing research and ideas for how best to teach astronomy. She uh, is one of the founders of kinesthetic or movement-based astronomy, and I'm hoping that we might be able to get to do a little bit of that this evening and you get a sense of that. And she also is doing a lot of work together with Chaco Canyon and is here this evening to present on astronomy from Chaco Canyon. Testing, is that okay back there? Good? Yeah. Okay. Oh, and the other thing I have to mention is now that she's back in Colorado, she's running an astronomy bed and breakfast. <laughs> Astro Airbnb. Astro Airbnb. She has a couple of cars. In Boulder. <laughs> And we'll leave one up here, and if you want to snap a picture of it, and if you have any relatives or friends coming, it's really a cool place. Yeah, she said, she hasn't even been there yet, but she, it is a cool place. 
Thank you, Andrea. It's an honor to be here. I love the vibe that's going on here. Lots of juicy volunteer energy and young and older. And uh, what a lovely facility that's been created here. I had a lovely dinner with some of the board members and volunteers. And uh, thank you for, for that. So my belly is a little full of enchilada, but, but you know, that's OK, right? So I'm here to share something that's become an extraordinary passion for me, and that is spending time in Chaco Culture National Historical Park. Um, how many of you have been there before? Raise your hand. Aha. Three. <laughs> Out of 60. So what we hope is that the three of you will, will have, you'll be further edified, and um, that the rest of you will be inspired to go there. Uh, to see for yourself. And the thing about it is that it's on the way to nowhere. It's not convenient. You have to really intend and want to go there. And I hope that I will give you a sliver of motivation for that purpose. I'm actually wearing my Chaco scarf. I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring out where this can go that will stay. If it falls off me, that's how it is, OK? But, um, May I enlist the two of you for a moment? Could you just hold on to that edge? And would you hold on to the other edge? And I hope that by, can you hold it up as high as you can so everybody can see? This is a Chaco spirited scarf. And I hope that I will, you will also see why, right? Before the evening is over. Thank you, my dears. Very good. So here we go. <laughs> the timing was planned. Uh, okay. Read on. Could we crank that volume a little bit? Oh. Little Blue World, one of eight planets going around the sun. Our sun is the only star in the solar system. Our sun is just one of more than 100 billion stars. In our own spiral galaxy called the Milky Way, there are more than 100 billion other galaxies in our observable universe, each one with 100 billion stars. That's <gasps> that many stars in our universe. This means more stars than grains of sand on all the beaches of the Earth, and more hydrogen atoms in the tips of your thumb than stars in the observable universe. Got it? It's a vast universe, but you're pretty special. You're pondering the whole dang thing. How common is that? We don't know. Right? And now, in all of that vast cosmos, we get to talk about this little red dot right here. This is the general four corners area. You recognize where Utah and Colorado and New Mexico and Arizona come together. So northwestern New Mexico is where we're headed. Chaco Culture National Historical Park is a World Heritage Site. Okay, so it's been deemed one of, you know, by UNESCO as one of the most special places on the planet worthy of preservation. This is my godson, and I gave him this T-shirt uh, this Christmas. It's also an International Dark Sky Park that was designated in 2013. Um, Although these light domes in this long exposure of the Milky Way with Fajada Butte show you that it's not immune to light pollution. And I'm just going to say this not to depress us all. I'm not ending with it, but I am going, I have to say it because I've been going there off and on for like a dozen years now. And um, you see, this is, you can see this, it's in the middle of what should be a dark place, but this is happening now all around Chaco within five miles of it, um, the gas and oil invasion is considerable and there are lots of methane flares that are causing orange skies uh, even in beloved Chaco. So uh, hopefully we'll be sensible about that. All right, I'm not going to dwell there though. I'm going to dwell on the, my passion for this place. 
Uh, this is just a lovely way of seeing that, yes, it changes seasons. It goes from minus 39 degrees to, to 102, right? It's a very broad, high desert climate there. And I've been there in all of those kinds of climates. This is uh, the famous Fahara Butte. You've probably seen the most famous geological feature there. And it's, of course, well known because right in here is where the so-called sun dagger is. How many have heard of the sun dagger? Even if you haven't been to Chaco, you may have seen a PBS program. Yes, a few more of you have heard of that. So Chaco is famous astronomically for um, the sun dagger, um, which is atop Fajada Butte, a petroglyph so-called. You see the spiral that's carved into the rock. And a pictograph, this is the so-called, quote, supernova pictograph, right? Possibly depicting a supernova that occurred during the peak of the Chacoan civilization, which would have been the middle of the 11th century, right? 1054 AD. Now, one thing that's a big science lesson is the difference between description and interpretation. Now, if I were to describe that pictograph, what's painted on the rock, I would say, well, there's a hand, a star-like uh, uh, figure, and a crescent figure. Basic fundamental description. Now, if I were to interpret it, this one interpretation is the possibility, well, it could be Venus and the crescent, but well, it could be this supernova that was visible in the night, in the day sky for two weeks, right? It was a day star for two weeks. We know that because the Chinese recorded in writing and these folks would have seen it. So it's also a very basic lesson of a petroglyph versus a pictograph, and there's lots and lots and lots of rock imagery in, in Chaco, and those are two of the most famous. And I'll say more about the sun dagger. We're gonna make a journey, a visual journey, to the top of Fajara Butte to see more about what's going on with the, uh, the famous sun dagger. This is another reason that it's a World Heritage Site. This is an archeological gem on a global scale. This is called Pueblo Bonito. Um, you know, a, the size of a human in here would be like right there. Okay, so it's a very, very large, the largest, most excavated so-called great house constructed by these people living in the middle by today's standard of nowhere that was the center of everywhere in its day. So all of these red dots are great houses in this broader region. So you see the four corners right up there in the, I guess I have this, uh, this device that I can, right here. There's the, where the four states come together. Here's Chaco. There's about a dozen of these great houses inside the boundary of the park, but there are others all over the region. So we're talking about Chaco Canyon being the center of a big regional phenomena that encompasses tens of thousands of square miles. This is just the place where there's the greatest cluster of great houses, okay? And these great houses often if not invariably, have astronomical meaning and connection associated with them. Now, note, those of you who have been to Chaco know that this is, you know, this is a way in, right? These yellow ones are prehistoric roads. It used to be, uh, you know, that all roads led to Chaco in the time of its peak. But in fact, today, it's a very rough dirt road that's difficult to, to navigate. It's the only national park left it's hard to get to. And may it ever be so for me, right? Because it's an adventure to get there. It's very much out of the way. As soon as they pave that road, it's gonna be like Mesa Verde. It's gonna be like Grand Canyon on the South Rim, right? It's just, you won't have the access to the back country. You're gonna be bused to, to special places. It's still possible, right, to have a really nice backcountry self-guided experience in Chaco Canyon. So I encourage you to get your bones there before gas and oil has got it all paved all the way in. All right, this is just a picture of uh, this little cartoon. All of those streaks up there are Chaco roads, um, all these lines, right? And we didn't discover them until the 70s when we had aerial photography, right? And so now we know this is a cartoon of downtown Chaco here. Here's Pueblo Bonito, that, that beautiful excavated building. That's the footprint of Bonito. This is Chetro Kettle, the second largest great house in the whole system. And I'm passionate about this in-between place. I give uh, and have developed and give guided walks in this in-between place. This is called amphitheater. Interesting, very interesting acoustic effects. I'm a singer and you can have an extraordinary echo 
in this place. And Hopi ethnography suggests that why here for the two largest great houses in the system, it may well have had something to do with the way the acoustic interacts with the rock. So there's a whole field now called archaeoacoustics. Fascinating. This is the source of, there's a cross canyon capability of communicating sound. So maybe they say, the Hopi stories say the, the first people walked the canyon uh, walls and sung to the canyon walls and how the walls responded told us where to put our home. So there may be something to that connection, let alone the fact that this is a crossroads, Pueblo Alto straight through this amphitheater onto a building called Sincletzin and an east-west line here. This may well be the center of the center place, the center of the whole piece of action. So my research and interpretive activities have focused on this place in between, this in-between space. Our Western minds tend to get fixed on the, the thing, and I want to focus people on the interconnection between the things, right? the relationships. And I think that we're closer to the Chacoan and indigenous mindset if we go there. Here's a real live aerial photography uh, by a guy named Adriel Heisey, who runs around in an ultralight, hanging his feet out, you know, and taking wonderful pictures. Here's the amphitheater. You see Pueblo Bonito here, right? Signature Chacho kettle, less excavated. And here's that curve. You can see it very nicely here, the curved part. I'm just introducing you a little bit to the physiography of Chaco so that I can then speak about it more astronomically. He, this is a Pueblo Alto here. Again, this is where all those roads, you can see a little bit of vestige of the prehistoric roads. You gotta be careful not to confuse them with you know, our modern roads. Okay, getting a sense of this in-between place, child of threatening rock right here. Big in my personal story of Chaco thus far. I have had been privileged to participate in archaeoastronomy research teams out there. That is a load of fun, you know, where we're going out and um, seeing and seeking possibility of alignment and horizon calendars and so on, and interpreting. There's another look at Child of Threatening Rock, and this is me in my uniform following a beautiful rain and a rim-to-rim -rim rainbow. Yeah, the picture can't do it justice, but the sky phenomenon in Chaco at any time of day is truly, truly wonderful. So this is Child of Threatening Rock. <laughs> you can see why it's Threatening Rock. A much larger version of that uh, crashed in 1941, uh, just a little bit further uh, to the west of this rock. Uh, but uh, right in front of this rock is where I was privileged to discover that a winter solstice sunset easing right into that notch, such that a naked eye observer could actually observe the, the diamond ring effect of it. Right, I mean, because an ancient sun priest is not gonna, can't just stare at the sun. These days we have filters and eclipse glasses and things that allow us to look right at the sun and our eyes are protected, right? But, um, and well, there are probably some people alive who can actually train themselves to look at the sun without protection, but that should not be us, okay? Um, yes, uh, so, uh, this was thrilling to realize that in this very culturally rich in-between place, it was possible to have a horizon feature take the winter solstice sun. Winter solstice the world over, as you know. What do we celebrate around the winter solstice? What do you celebrate? December 21st, right? It's the time of greatest darkness and the return of the light. Cultures the world over are celebrating something associated with that time period, right? And these folks, as plenty of evidence, were no different. These are our ancestors too. Oh, I'm just showing off that I am a volunteer. See, like you. <laughs> it's really good to be a volunteer. It really feels good. Okay, so these are the sorts of things I'm doing in Chaco. I support the Night Sky program, and it was one of the first in the Park Service, and now they're all over the place. Um, it may still be the only domed telescope <coughs> in the Park uh, in the Park Service, there's possibly one other just outside the boundary. Uh, so giving star tours, running tells the kind of things that you do here. 
Um, special events, moonwalks, we get to go out and watch full moonrises in Bonito, the equinox and solstice sunrises and sunsets. I'm actually trying to get them onto sunsets after that discovery of that. <laughs> you know, it's like sunsets, we can do sunsets. People don't have to get up so early. We could do sunset programs also. Um, they said no, but I did them anyway, and I'll show you some. <laughs> um, and Andrea probably knows a little of that hood spot. Okay. Um, Astro Jazz, which is a, a passionate uh, uh, thing of mine, I'll say a little bit more about that. It integrates music, astronomical imagery, and commentary, you know, much like we'll experience this evening. Um, development and implementation of interpretive programs that connect to Chaco's center place, that place in between the two largest great houses, and then field work in archival research and photography for archaeoastronomy, uh, which is the study of ancient cultures astronomy, right? So it's a combined physical and social science. So this was the poster for 2016 Summer Solstice. I partnered with the guitarist and singer Bucky Reardon, and we got to do a solstice celebration program. And I uh, tooled a lot of uh, jazz standards and originals to Chaco. So sunrise, sunset. You know? So instead of the lyrics for Fiddler on the Roof, it was, you know, um, uh, you know, it was about archaeoastronomy and it was about sunrises and sunsets and horizon calendars and things. So I morphed the lyric to be playful, uh, you know, with it. So, you know, cameras and compasses we carried, archaeoastronomers at play. You get the idea. <laughs> yes, okay. So the Chaco uses and enlivens all of me. Everything that I am gets used there, and that is why I keep going back. I love to be outside. I'm a researcher, I'm an interpreter, an educator, a singer. I get to be all of that as a volunteer in Chakov. And maybe here too now. Let's get serious. Who? Ancestors of modern Puebloan tribes. You've heard of Hopi, Akomazuni. All of these people, there are 21 of them, affiliate with Chaco from their ancestry and their sense of, of belonging. So modern 21 Puebloan tribes and the Navajo all affiliate with Chaco today. And there's a tribal council that helps Chaco make decisions about what to show in their visitor center and so on. Regional network of great houses, monumental sandstone architecture. When this time period, maybe getting started in 850 and maybe finally being completely abandoned in 1250, Four Corners region with a nexus in the canyon. Human labor, stone tools, no horse, no wheel, no metal. Crazy. Was it enslaved? Was it inspired? We don't know. We have both in human history. But whatever it is, extraordinary. There are cathedrals going up in Europe contemporaneously, right, with, with this. Why? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. <laughs> if that's what you're here for, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're going to talk about evidence for astronomy. Now, here's a framing that I have, I invented this afternoon, motivated by coming to speak with you. And I actually think it's going to go places. It will certainly be used in Chaco, but it's being used for the first time here. Okay? I thought, how could I try to help you understand the space of evidence for astronomical observation and knowledge in Chaco? And I felt like, okay, well, if I the architecture, the buildings, Horizons, rock imagery, pictographs, petroglyphs, right? Light and shadow, the play of light and shadow. It turns out that if you do this framing, I can hang the various kinds of phenomena. And I want to take you on a fantastic speedy tour of some of these phenomena that involve the interaction, light and shadow and rock imagery, architecture and a horizon architecture and a light and shadow, right? So I have different examples of this that hopefully some of which you get to go see yourself. So we're gonna start with ar architecture. This is an aerial view of the largest great kiva, kiva, Hopi word, ceremonial kind of structure, okay? Um, you can't go in there anymore. This image was made when people could still go in there, but people, the reason I'm told that we can't go in there anymore is that people were, scattering people's ashes in there, right? And they just, you just can't do that. So they, they shut it down. No longer can people go in there. 
uh, unfortunately. But rinconada, casa rinconada. What's so, well, I want to show you everything. So uh, these are examples. I'll tell you why that's perfectly aligned to north and south. And you've got to watch the sky in order to get the cardinal directions as precisely as the Chicoans did. Interaction between light and shadow and architecture through doors and windows. Interaction rock art and light phenomenon like this dagger of light through the center of a spiral. That's actually on top of Fahada Butte. Rock imagery, this is the, you, you recognize the uh, supernova pictograph. And this may well be a petroglyph associated with a total solar eclipse at a time of high solar activity. And then, of course, there is the uh, quintessential horizon observation of a sunset or even a sunrise that could be. Okay, so there's the kind of spectrum and the overview of the kinds of things going on in Chaco that give us plenty of evidence that there was sun and sky watching. All right, here we go. So, horizon observing. Now, here's where we go. You've seen this diagram in your school books, right? <laughs> but when we tie it to what's going on in Chaco and a little kinesthetic demo, is pretty cool, okay? So what I like to do, the traditional sun watcher knows, so if you imagine this is south and this north, this is east, so what's happening over here in the east generally? The sun is appearing to rise, hmm? right? And then appearing to set over here, right, in the west. Now you learned in school that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, right? Well, it does two days a year. <laughs> right? Uh, on the equinoxes, meaning the first day of spring, first day of fall, right? What, what dates are those? The, the fall equinoxes, right? And spring? Yes? Okay. Yes. And solstice, what do we mean by that? We mean summer solstice, the first day of summer, right? Winter solstice, first day of winter, right? So winter solstice, solstice, sun stand still. This is where, this would be the winter sun path. You see how it's rising very far south of east, not getting up very high in the sky, and setting very far south of west. So it's a very low trajectory in the sky, right? Winter. Makes sense, right? Not very many daylight hours. Here in the summer, we have the sun rising very far north. We can hardly see it. I can hardly see it. Over here somewhere, right? Rising very far north of east, going way up in the sky, not overhead, because only in the tropics does the sun actually uh, get directly overhead at these uh, moderate latitudes we live. And then you see uh, the sun setting very far north of west on the summer solstice. Much more time in the sky, much longer daylight hours, right? Much more direct heating. Makes sense, right? Okay, whoops, I'm not sure how that happened. Okay, so what a sun watcher in Chaco knew they would have a horizon of canyon wall or rock formations. And basically, by looking at that, they could tell the time of year by where the sun was rising and where the sun was setting, right? So you could actually superpose you know, days of the year on this and tell what time of year. Why would it be important to tell time like that? Why do we care? Agriculture, Agriculture planting. Ceremony, all of these kinds of things, all right? Now, if we were standing here at Casa Rinconada, which you can do, and looking off toward the east, we would see a horizon like this. Okay? Now, and the equinox here, from that position on this, the edge of Casa Rinconada, we would see the sun rise here on March and September in the equinoxes and way to the far south over here in the winter and way up here in the summer. Now, I want to ask you, anybody have a birthday today? Near today? 
January birthday? January birthday. Sweet. Okay. Wow. Okay. So. Okay. How many how many trips around the sun have you made in your life? Thirty-seven. Good. How many trips have you made? Do they get it, right? This is not bad, right? You know how many trips you've made, don't you? See, I'm usually late for people's birthdays, so I like to say, Happy New Orbit. <laughs> and then even if I'm a few days late, I, it's still early in the orbit, right? So Happy New Orbit around the sun. I think this is, this is important. You can, you know, and, uh, congratulations on the completion of your 37th orbit around the sun. Yes. Yeah. So your birthday cards can take on a whole new meaning, right? The everyday event, astronomical meaning. Okay. So, but now I want you to find January, January birthday. Can everyone think for a moment? Where would a January sun rise on this horizon? Generally speaking, where would it be? So everybody has an idea. Good, all right, everybody's thinking about it. That's what you're invited to do. So here it says September, right? So this would be October, November, December, January. Oh, it's not left to right? Oh no, no. see that, this is Western mind has got to get into the cyclical, right? So yeah. Here where November was would be where January is, right? January sunrise, February, Mar March, <laughs> April, May, June, no. July, <laughs> August, September. See how it goes? This is what a sun watcher knew, but of course they didn't know those names, right? I have other names right, for what those months were, but those are the names that we use. So everybody can find basically where the sun would rise on that horizon on your birthday. Yeah? You kind of got, got a feel for that. So that's what a sun watcher knew. They would find a sacred place, a culturally meaningful place to, to stand or sit and watch, and they would become very familiar with how the sun was rising and setting, right, on a horizon. So. Now, let's see, what I want to do is link that. So now, a little kinesthetic demonstration. <clears throat> this, my friends, is the sun. Okay, I'm doing my best. All right. Now, I'm about to do a, a model that uses the human body as the Earth. It's not going to be to scale. So I want to take a moment to give you a sense of scale. So. If I, if this were the sun here, right, about the size of a large grapefruit or a small cantaloupe, it's actually about 10 billion times larger. Okay, but where would the earth, what size would the earth be? What size would the earth be on that scale? What do you think? Show me with your hands. Show me with your hands. How, how yeah, turns out right there. Pencil tip. Pencil tip. Now you know why you were chasing around for them, <laughs> right? Right. So a million of these would fit inside of, of, of a sun, right? So the Earth is impossibly smaller. Now where would it be on this scale if in distance? So if it were in this corner of the room, I've done the math. Somebody gave me the dimensions of the room. It's a little bit beyond that corner over there where that pencil tip Earth would be compared to the grapefruit sun. Where would the moon be on that scale? Oh. Would it be nearer the sun or nearer the pencil tip? Near the pencil tip. Yeah, if, you, if the pencil tip were in the palm of your hand, back beyond that corner a couple of feet, then it would be, the moon would be orbiting in the palm of your hand. So that gives you a sense of the real Earth, sun, moon to scale. How many saw the total solar eclipse this summer, this past summer? <laughs> Yeah. You all get A pluses. Chaco is next on the list. Why not? Okay, very good. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, so there, it's the beautiful coincidence that we have the Earth and Moon the same angular size in the sky that allows us this 
beautiful phenomenon of a total solar eclipse, which the Chacoans saw one in 1097. They had to have seen it. Totality was right over the top of the canyon. Interesting. Peak of their civilization, 1054 AD, supernova, 1097, total solar eclipse. I digress. Okay. <coughs> Where's the nearest star on this scale? Canada. <laughs> Can Canada, where? Yeah. Yeah. It turns out that if this were on the Brooklyn Bridge in New York, this grapefruit, the nearest star in our galaxy, Alpha Centauri, would be on the, the uh, Golden, Golden Gate Bridge, the whole distance of the US wide. That's the distance between the stars. That's, the, that's why we call it space. <laughs> it's a lot of space in between there, right? Pictures of galaxies make it seem like they're all crammed close together, but they're not. But the Chacoans didn't know this. This was all on the plane of the sky, right? I mean, they're not having necessarily the modern understanding. But what I want to do now is with a kinesthetic demonstration that will involve a few of you at first and then all of you, I want to see if I can do something that I learned um, to do in Chaco. I've been doing kinesthetic astronomy for decades, but this abbreviated version, which gives you a powerful way of connecting this, what a sun watcher, an ancient sun watcher knew, with our modern understanding of tilt, rotation, and orbit, right? What we learned in school. Okay, you ready for that? All right, so in order to do this, I need, let's see, I need somebody, um, this is really quite weird that I have to dig this thing out of my, okay. <laughs> yeah, put that on YouTube, all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. What are your, when are your birthdays? July. July. So why don't you be a, a summer guy? And I think, what do I want to do? I want to quickly figure it out. All right. So we're going to put summer over here. Okay. Can you hold that so people can see? So um, where will winter be? Over here? Who's got a winter birthday? Well, we know you do. December 17th. <laughs> okay. You get the idea that, of course, the seasons are changing here, right? Yeah. Okay, so what, um, if the Earth is moving in this sense, each year goes around once, right? Isn't that how it goes? Is that how it goes? Yeah. Okay, so if this is December, and that's June. What has this got to be? March and September. No. Oh, if you're going in a circle, then no. That would be wrong. December. January. Aha. Uh -huh. Who has a March birthday? I love that shirt. Thank you. Look at this. Look, look at the shirt. Look, look. The, wow. We'll get the Very good. Back. Very good. Thank you for that. All right. I'll Smart. see you in the alley. I want that. <laughs> All right. Whoever you are, get me one of those. Okay. All right. So March, April, May, June. July, okay, so who has a September birthday? There you go. You are anticipating every need. And naturally, it's the tallest guy, right? Right in the front. <laughs> right. <laughs> you get the idea, right? And now, for those of you who are educators or who are love to teach, one of the very powerful things now, once you've set up a circular calendar like this, you can actually ask people to go to their birthdays. So you three, go to your birthdays, please. Where is Earth in its orbit around the sun when it's your birthday? And I could ask all of you to do that, right? Each of you would know where to go. And now, if you want to be a naturalist and teach about bears hibernating and deers and flowers, you can do that too, right? It's a very, very powerful little circle right here for teaching and learning. When's your birthday? October. Did you get it right? Mm -hmm. When's your birthday? 
June 9th, when's your birthday? June 13th. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see, nine months before. <laughs> so you guys are really literally elbow to elbow. It very often happens in a group of 30 that there's a big gap somewhere and then I can make a joke, you know. It's like, <laughs> in these parts you don't have, yeah, never mind. Okay, all right, excellent. Okay, so now, um, if I could ask the, uh, let's just keep the people with the signs up for the moment. If I could ask the rest of you go back over there for the moment. Bye-bye, okay. <laughs> now, here we go. Let's put those down for a second or put them on a chair. How about that? Just lean them up on a chair right here. And keep them in their position. Each of you be earth right so each of you are going to make like earth so you got to imagine yourself one of these folks okay so it looks like this what is this this is a north pole this is north america rub your south america oh yeah well it's not obscene i promise it's just you know it's a little bit down here right on, on a guy like you it's way up there in your <laughs> <laughs> so on the back right What's back here? China, Asia, you know, um, Australia, down under, mate, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so can, you be, can you imagine yourself then in this circle? If I could get each of you to face toward the sun, okay? So each of them is facing toward the sun. Now, take an E and W, and given what I just showed you about North America being on your chest like this, which hand should the eastward show them your E and W? Which hand should these go into, right? Imagining, so you can imagine for yourself. Uh-huh. Let's see how they do. So, North America, North Pole, if you put, your, put uh, North America on here, where's New York? New York's right here. Uh-huh. Is that in the West? <laughs> ah, good. How about this guy? So, here's your North Pole. Here's North America, right? Arctic, whoop, here we are. New York, California? California? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Way to go. You got it. Okay. So you get the idea, right? So now, what time of day are they all at? If you could face the sun for me and stand in this position. Okay. Boy, I really want you to switch with him, but anyway. <laughs> So what time of day? The sun is midway between east and west, right? Mm -hmm. Hold your arms out like this, guys. So that would be what time along a line down the middle of the front of them? Yeah. Would be noon, right? What time would it be back here in China and Asia? Midnight. Midnight, right? Faced away from the sun. So if you turn away, go ahead and turn toward your east, turn away. So your back is to the sun. Back is to the sun. What time of day is that now down the line in the front of them? Midnight. Midnight. Okay, back to, keep going, back to noon. Everybody with me? Show me sunset, guys. What do they do? <laughs> yeah, the earth doesn't go that way. I'm left-handed. <laughs> so you're, now if you look at the sun, then it, it should be disappearing in your west, is it? No. <laughs> He's <Yes>. left-handed. <laughs> yes. Okay, so everybody's turned so that the sun is disappearing in their west, right? Because really what's happening when the sun is rising and setting, of course, is the earth is turning, right? This makes that plausible to people oh. your age, right? <laughs> okay, so now if you keep turning, you go to keep turning in the same direction, you go to midnight, can you make sunrise happen? Make sunrise happen? Where are they going to go? 
They're going to turn until they look down their E arm. Go ahead and look. You see the sun appearing in the east as you continue to turn. Does this, you, right? Did you see this? Mm -hmm. You've got to imagine yourself one of these people. Better to put yourself inside one of them than trying to look at all of them, right? Mm -hmm. For the moment. Just imagine yourself one of these folks. How, now, well, how did it turn out as all guys? <laughs> uh, that's interesting. I had to be careful about that. You, you probably have birthdays. With you. Yeah, you all have June birthdays too. And I didn't volunteer. See, that's how it works, educators. See? Okay, I'm back to noon. Let's see if you guys can do this fast. Ready? Sunset. Midnight. Sunrise. <laughs> noon. The earth does not do that. <laughs> How long does that rotation take? 24 hours. 24 hours, you got it. Okay, so now, here's the power. So we've got the idea that the Earth is orbiting once a year, it's rotating once a day, and now there's this other thing called the tilt. Mm -hmm. The tilt of the axis. Now, there's a lot of wrong ideas about this out there. I'm hoping that all of the bad schooling that you have had, except for people at Little Thompson Observatory, that would never happen, or Boulder County, that would never happen. But I hope that this moment can be a little bit uh, cool for you. All right, so we're going to say that, in fact, the sun, the Polaris, is over this way. Yes, you got it, right? So the north pole of Earth is tilted toward what? Polaris, Polaris the pole star. You know, you're self-selecting. Lots of people in Chaco don't know that. What? I don't know. The sun? No, oh, no, the pole star, the north star, Polaris, right? By definition, if we were at the north pole, it would be right overhead. But here we have, it's tilted in space. I'm sorry, it's a back bend for you. Can you hear that? No, I can do that. So yeah, no, no. Co <laughs> <laughs> okay, so forward bend from the waist here. Okay, now notice, Earth is tilted toward Polaris in space, right? Here's something interesting. Now, this is the northern hemisphere, right? Here's the northern hemisphere. Well, wait a minute now. When Earth is in this place in orbit, the northern hemisphere is leaning toward the sun, right? Notice that by the time the Earth moves over to this place in orbit, the northern hemisphere is leaning away from the sun. But the tilt toward Polaris is the same. The tilt does not change over the course of a year or even a human lifetime, right? The tilt toward Polaris is the same here as it is here, but because the Earth moves in orbit six months, this hemisphere is leaning away over here and the hemisphere is leaning toward here. Now let me just, like, I'm going to do it, right? I'm going to move over here. Now, am I in the same orientation as him? Well, I am. I'm just at a different time of day. I'm at midnight and he's at noon. But if I turn myself, keeping my Polaris, look, my hemisphere is leaning away. So when my hemisphere is leaning away, I'm in winter. Okay, so let me ask you. So this is a winter season. What about down here? That's summer. winter now. This is winter, right? <laughs> this is summer, right? Okay, so this is June 21st. What's the date down here? June 21st. Oh, they're too good. You train these people really well. I usually get some takers for it being different days of the year. And I, but, all right, I couldn't fool you. I couldn't fool you. So now, notice that on the equinoxes, the hemisphere is not leaning toward or away, right? But it's equal day, equal night, right? So here we're going to have longer days. Here we're going to have shorter days, right? So you would buy, when your hemisphere is leaning away, you're in winter. When you're in a position of Earth's orbit such that the tilt toward Polaris makes your hemisphere lean away, you are in winter. Fair enough? Now, we're going to connect this to that horizon. Because we know that what's happening at these different times of year is making the sun rise and at different places on the horizon, right? And we make, in the winter, we have this very low trajectory. I am, I'm not sure what I did with my 
clicker. <laughs> if somebody could help me find my clicker. Um, and then, uh, and, and it's going to have a high trajectory. So now let's get you uh, out of your back bends and we're going to break this model here for a second. Okay, so we're going to ask all of you to stand up, please. Oh, that's okay, we, everybody face the screen. Face the screen. So now you are all Earths, right? You are all Earths. Touch your North Pole, please. That makes your South Pole, you don't have to touch your South Pole, but, he's <laughs> <laughs> but you get the idea. For the yoginis, it's the perineum, but tailbone is good enough. Where's your equator? Okay, and is it only in the front? Yeah. No, it's also in the back. Your North America on your chest. Your South America down here, Asia. Okay, you got it all going on? You're, you're imagining yourself as the whole Earth. Now, I'm going to imagine that you're facing, I don't know what direction this is, but you're facing southward and you're looking at the sun, okay? And you're seeing the trajectory. And Chaco, this is brilliant because I can see, say that wall is due east and this one is due west. I know, but never mind, don't do that. <laughs> Stay in my model. Stay in my model. So imagine the sun is rising over here and arcing. Okay? Okay? So in the winter, it would be rising in that corner and setting over here in this corner. And in the summer, it would be way up like this, right? Okay. So now, you told me you believe that if your hemisphere is leaning away, you're in winter, yeah? Okay, great. So, sun. Okay. If you lean your hemisphere away, go ahead. Do you have to look higher or lower to see the sun? Ta-da. If you lean, your hemisphere is leaning away, you're going to have to look lower. The sun will have a lower trajectory in the sky, less time in the sky, less direct sunlight, winter, cold when your hemisphere is leaning away. And that's going to be the trajectory where it's rising very far south of east, not going very high in the sky, and setting very far south of west. Fair enough? Yeah? Yes. <laughs> you got it. OK, so that connects what a sun watcher knew in this understanding of the horizon. Why is it rising so far? Ah, we're in a place in Earth's orbit where our hemisphere is leaning away due to the tilt of Polaris. It's not that the tilt changes. It doesn't. In spite of what the best websites out there say. <laughs> and we do wobble, but over tens of thousands of years. But yeah, we don't change the tilt. <laughs> we kind of keep it the same. All right, thank you very much. If you could just put those E's and W's down on those chairs. Thank you very much for my volunteers. <laughs> Yay. So now you go to Chaco and you find out where those trajectories are in the sky and it's like, whoa, it comes alive for you. So my favorite place to teach that, thank you for your participation, is actually out there where you can see those trajectories. So here's a wordy, wordy summary of all of the type of Chacoan display of astronomical knowledge and then the featured examples. I'm going to probably get through a couple of more, but the sunrise or sunset interaction with a distinctive horizon feature at a time of cultural, time and place of cultural interest. This is what we've been talking about here at, to get going. I'm just going to show you for your aesthetic beauty. If you stood here on the western side of the largest excavated great house, check what we discovered. Our team discovered this, that the sunset would interact. We got people thinking about sunsets, right? <laughs> would interact with horizon feature when you're looking west. So check it out. There's the horizon. Even this little distinct knob right here. OK, watch. That's through a filter. And I've started to use filters in the interpretive program, arc welder filters in the interpretive program, because we use them in arcuate astronomy. We can watch the disk interact with the horizon. It's so fun, right? The ancient observers didn't have the benefit of that, or maybe they did. Maybe they used obsidian. Maybe they found something that would allow them to do a similar thing. Who knows? But boy, is it fun. Now that's without filter. Check it out. Bye-bye. Winks out. 
in that little L-shaped feature from the west side of Bonito. Okay, here's my little cartoon again. We've talked about horizon feature. Um, I want to talk about, uh, more about Casa Rinconada because look at this. This thing is more precisely aligned north-south than their North Star was. This is a thousand years ago. A thousand years ago, it was six degrees out, Polaris. Today, it's right on, right, the North Star, but it was six degrees out. So they couldn't have used Polaris to, 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 their, to this beautiful north-south alignment they got in their buildings. Not only within buildings, but between buildings. They had to have observed the, this trajectory of the sun we're talking about. How many of the scouts have used a gnomon, you know, stick in the ground to try to tell the directions, right? See how the shadow moves over the course of the day? Probably something like that to get these directions as well as the half. So north-south. So if you put a camera here at night, in modern times, look what you get. That's how good it is. Those are star trails when you put a long exposure on the North Star, it's the star that appears not to move. And the other stars appear to revolve around it, that place in the sky. So the center of that, those star trails is Polaris, is the pole star in the Chacoan sky. That guy got permission to go down there at night and take, I'm very jealous of that. Yeah. So now east-west, look through those doors and windows and we see the equinox sunrise coming through the east-west doors. Remember those two days a year, right? That rises in the east, exactly. Okay, alignment to cardinal directions within buildings, another example. Also alignment between buildings. From Casa Rinconada, you can look up and see Stonehenge-like walls of New Alto. It's, um, and it's in here. Bonito is over here. This is part of the in-between place that I love to interpret down there. So alignment to cardinal directions between buildings. These cardinal directions mean that they were sky watchers. They had to have been watching how the sun moves in order to get these directions and care about them as they have. So how did they determine them? No compass, okay? Okay, North Star, no, that was off six degrees. So they probably used this simple gnomon, which I just mentioned. Right? I don't want to take our time to explain exactly how that works, but that's something in activity that you know, we could do here to study how you could get a very precise east-west by watching the shadow of a well-placed stick in the ground. Okay, where are we now? Interaction of light and shadow with architecture. So here we are back at Casa Rinconada. Can you tell I like this place? On the summer solstice, the sun rises up and a little light square descends into one of the niches. You can see that. I encourage you to. It's quite a lovely, uh, and you can see the shadows of people. There's lots of people and there's usually dancing and drumming in either Bonito or near the visitor center. It's a very special time. This is the sun has risen. It's coming through a door, but it hasn't yet descended into that niche. So. There's a doorway through which the sun is passing, and there's the niche that the square of light is falling into. Now, this is the kiva. This is the kiva. So, this, it was so it was covered, and that's a good point. And I was just about to say, these alignments are things we enjoy today, and they probably had something to do with how the building was placed, but they may not have been enjoyed in this precise way by the Chacoans because they would either have a roof or the wall would be taller. But what, we, what it tells us is that they were paying attention when they're putting the footprint of their building, they're paying attention to how it's oriented and to how these windows and doors are placed. Even if it's not something that they were inside enjoying the light splashing through there, right? But we can do it as modern Chacoans and visitors. We can go there and we can see this. So, sunlight interaction with architecture is um, evidence that they were sky watchers, even if that's not exactly the interaction that they were watching. This is a so-called corner door, very difficult to make architecturally, and the winter solstice sun comes up through that and puts a light square precisely in a corner of a room. 
beautiful to witness these days, they may not have witnessed it in that same way for the reason that the gentleman cites. It may have been a wall that's there that didn't allow it. And yet, that is facing in that direction and they know it, right? So that's, that's this, the essence. Okay, we're zooming around now. Whirlwind tour of the types of phenomena. The sun dagger, ah, light interacting. Here's Fahada Butte. Sun dagger is on top of this. You ready? It's gonna be fast. Boom. We're getting closer. This, these images come from a friend who, the, a helicopter landed on top of it in 2009, 2009 and they had to take a team up there to see if they'd done any damage. And, um, and so my friend got a lot of these photographs. We're zooming in. Right there is where we're going. This is where the famous sun dagger on top of Fahad Abirid is located. That gives you a sense of how big it is relative to the human. Those are the slabs, and there's a large spiral petroglyph behind those slabs. So the sunlight, the noonday sun at different times of year is coming in between these slabs and casting its light on this spiral that's underneath those rocks. And there's the three, so, this, so the petroglyph is behind those three slabs, okay? Here's from underneath. You see the spirals and you see the sunlight is coming through the different gaps between those slabs. At, and at different times of year, the sun is at a different altitude, as we already said. Summer sun highest, winter sun lowest. It goes through those cracks and put, used to put, as of 1989, doesn't work anymore, but it used to put these spiral patterns, sorry, these dagger patterns on the spiral. So in the summer solstice, the dagger of light split the spiral, right? Let's see, yes, so, so spring equinox here, summer here, fall here, and winter here, daggers of light on either side. That was in 1989. In 1989, it was discovered that it no longer worked the hypothesis is because of visitor and research traffic wearing away, eroding the base beneath it. It was an egg on the face of the Park Service because it kind of didn't get preserved right under their noses, right? So that they, the sands beneath the rock shifted, yeah, just enough to put it out of alignment. Yeah, it's, it's sad. Fortunately, it was discovered in time to document how it worked. Can you imagine from a thousand years ago? And then in our time, it slips in a way that isn't recoverable. And that's not unique to that location. Daggers of light know. interacting with petroglyphs is not unique to this location. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, please don't forgive me. I'm, I'm telling you what's unique and interesting in Chaco, but that is this kind of phenomenon, all of those kinds of phenomenon, are true throughout the Southwest. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, and there's many places you can see. This is kind of unique because it's a noonday marker. Um, what season is being marked here? Can you tell using the key? Right, that's the winter pattern. Yep. Which one is here? June, you got it. And now this is just a little animation showing you over uh, a f you know, several minutes of time how that dagger comes down, right? Um, this is, it's, it's, this is to show you it's off now. Doesn't work. So that gives you a sense of the scale and where, that, where the dagger is happening. So light and shadow interaction with the petroglyph, that's where we were. Depiction of major astronomical event in petroglyph or pictograph, let's go there. Here we are, we're building it up. Boom, remember? This was the possible interpretation of a total solar eclipse, possible interpretation of that supernova, right, in 1054. So Piedra del Sol, this is near the visitor center, and at the Astronomy Fest uh, this last September, we started interpreting it more, so more people are seeing it. It's not otherwise open to the public. But it's cool, you can go back and say, wow, there was a total solar eclipse uh, visible there in 10, uh, 1097, and it was at a time of high solar activity. So when the coronal streamers, could there have been a solar storm in those few minutes of totality that caused the coronal streamers to kink up, right? Kinky solar streamers. 
We know from sp modern spacecraft imagery that you can torque the corona around pretty well. It's a little bit of an out there interpretation. Those of you, you've, most of you have seen the total solar eclipse, so what do you suppose that could be? Similar kind of pecked. What do you suppose that might be in the sky? When you eclipse the sun, of course, you can see Venus, the bright planets and stars, right? So one possible interpretation of a very similar pecking is that that was a bright star or planet. Another reason to possibly believe that it's interpretable as a rendering of that total solar eclipse. 1054 supernova, 1097 solar eclipse during solar maximum. Most people don't see, this is one of the, most, this is one of the best photographs of this place ever, right? You see the, what's possibly interpretable as the total solar eclipse, or sorry, as the uh, supernova in the day sky. Look at this. 1066. Look at this. What a lucky thing. If you be alive during all of these things, right? These are incredible sky events at the peak of the Chicoan phenomenon. They would have seen all of these, and did they render them in their rock art? and petroglyphs and pictographs. One interpretation is, yes, they did. I wanted to show you a close-up of that. This is very difficult to see. You can be staring right at it and not, and not see it. OK, and what we know, this is a modern image of the Crab Nebula, the thing that exploded back in 1054, right? So uh, there remains the death of a star. And of course, we had to have a supernova explosion to make our own solar system with its heavier elements. You all probably know about stellar birth and death. You were looking at the Horion Nebula tonight through the telescope. I knew you would, <laughs> so that's why I put it in there. This is star forming region, right? Star forming region, stellar death, stellar birth. And I have, I'd like to share a little sample of a song that I wrote in celebration of this phenomenon. Like the stars We're born and die I don't have my musician so I can't sing it live. That, that's, that's me though. I promise. That carries Lives on. You can dance. Sorry. Dance. Oh, she's good. Oh. One day reclaim them. Thank you, my dear. so forth. Okay. <laughs> this is in celebration of the Women's March in Denver tomorrow. <laughs> okay, like the freaking supernova you're meant to be. Got it? Shine bright. Shine bright. All right, my gosh, could you believe it? We're like pretty much through this list of examples. I'll do it visually, right? There's where we've been. From horizon calendars to alignment of buildings to alignment between buildings to light and shadow in architecture to light and shadow in rock art to petroglyphs and pictographs that may be representing cool sky events that the Chicoans may have witnessed or certainly did witness during the peak. So finally, I'd like to share with you, this is the view from King Kletso, if you go on the winter solstice, this is where the public program is. We had a cloudy time, but in King Kletso, here's that center place. King Kletso is a little bit further to the west in the canyon. There's what it looks like. Get this. If you stand here two weeks before, 
you see the sunrise in that feature on the horizon. If you stand there on the solstice, you see it rise right in there. The footprint of the building was defined by where the winter solstice appeared to rise on the horizon. That's a pretty serious intimacy, right? In where you place your architecture. This is called King Kletso. It's, it's a Navajo yellow house. Um, and people are standing along this wall here to be on this line of sight, right? To see the sunrise. And this is this year. This is after the sun had rose. I said, look contemplative. Notice, <laughs> <laughs> notice how everyone is interpreting that a little bit differently. <laughs> I, these are my colleagues, uh, much beloved. Uh, and there are sometimes visitors with whom I feel, and I have a feeling that if any of you came down there while I was there, that I would have this rapport with you, right? There, sometimes there, there are visitors who just get it, and they just, wow, and they love it, right? And then they want to have selfies with you, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I want to have selfies with them. And then you take them out for special occasions, which is to take out the welder's ark filter and take them out on the next morning. By the way, the solstice means that it rises in the same place, plus or minus two days around that date. But people don't know that. So they only come for the one day. But in fact, the folks who then are the hardy ones camping, you see the beautiful light, you know, and you can see what's going on in this filtered view. See, this, you're seeing something more like this through these um, protective filters. And we've, we learned as archaeoastronomers that we can make photographs through here and, sh and really document the, the horizon interaction. So, my friends, I love this place. I call, it, I call you in, right? Only three of you have been there, and I really hope that that would change over the course of the next year or two. And remember, when you're walking in a place like Chaco, actually anywhere you are on the Earth, you're actually walking here, right? We are in space. I hate to break it to you, but it's not out there. All you know, it's like space begins at your feet, and here. View from the moon, and here. <laughs> Pale blue dot from the rings of Saturn, brought to you by Cassini, which recently demised. And I understand your next talk. You have a speaker coming in to talk to you about that uh, demise um, of Cassini and its dive into the Saturn atmosphere. And here, which one are we? That one, yeah, that one. Third rock from the sun, and here. <laughs> Right? When we see the Milky Way, we're seeing different parts of the spiral arms, depending on the time of year. And here, the Hubble Deep Field, where all of these specks are entire galaxies of 100 billion stars. The only ones that aren't are these ones with crosshairs. Bit of diffraction there, right? But there are only four of them in this image. One, two, three, four. Everything else? Five. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Everything else is an entire galaxy, and this is in a pencil tip field of view. We're walking in a pretty magnificent place. So down here is also out there. So may Chaco and your thumbs be portals to this, to this vast universe, this amazing place that we live in, and uh, using your special faculties of pondering the universe, we don't even know how common that is, right? So there you are, some images to leave you with. Um, I hope you'll visit, and I hope I'll be there at the same time. Thank you. My tail. Jazz. <laughs> <laughs>
this is a beautiful space you have. I just, I can't, I was blown away when I walked in here and to see your faces like this is just yum. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, ho I hope I get to come back. That would be wonderful. Oh, we'll bring you back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, any, any, uh, yeah, happy to. Yes, sir. Um, so when we were talking about the stun dagger up, up the um, top, were those all the way at the top of that rock formation, were they more of a ceremonial or like symbolic type of thing, or was it actually used for a purpose, like an applied? It's a, it's a wonderful question. And does that question dovetail with that? Is that where you, oh, OK. All right. No, I mean, so you know, it, yes, because these are noon markers on th these days, right? And there's not much space. Right? It's not like a place where lots of people could gather. Like that center space between the two largest great houses, the reason I was excited to find a sunset marker there, and I, I actually predict a, a sunrise marker there, is because that's a place where a thousand people could be witnessing right, this phenomenon. But as you rightly point out, on top of Fahada Butte, more likely this was a small collection of sun watchers the sun priests, you know, gathering to sort of just affirm. This my, that's my idea. Who knows? Nobody really knows for sure. But when I feel into it, my intuition is telling me I think that's a place where a smaller number of people made note of this and, and you know, uh, celebrated the occasion. That's, that's a really excellent question because there would be places that were really only for those, the watchers. Yeah. Yes. So on the far right, the middle picture where it has the supernova and then the crescent shape, how would you interpret the handprint as more of a, oh, a person did this, or how would you? How would you? A person did this? Yes. No, but why do you think they just put the handprint there? I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not understanding. So what does this handprint represent? What is, ah. Celestial objects and then a hand Ah, good, good question. Great question. Of course, I knew it was. It's, I just had to interpret it. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, I didn't emphasize this, but this, is all, uh, there, this was in the place in that, that little model that I showed you that was relating horizon to, to the rock imagery, right? And it's possible that the hand is, you know, looked that way and that's what you would see, right? Because that was looking to the east and they actually can do the tracking back and determine a date when the, the uh, crescent, the old crescent and, you know, the position of the supernova in the sky, which we know for, again from the Chinese records, might have appeared that way, right? And so the hand, you know, there are two rock uh, images that are very pervasive on our planet. One of them is the human hand, and the other is the spiral. Right? And they mean different things to different people. Even within the same culture, you can ask, what does that spiral mean? And some people would say, well, stand here to observe the sun. Um, uh, uh, water this way. We migrated that way. Uh, you know, right? I mean, uh, it, there, there's lots of interpretations to the description of a spiral. So yeah, a hand. Um, you know, could it, could it be? And I actually wonder, is it a left hand? Yes. <laughs> Our left-hander certainly thinks so. That was really, oh, that's good. <laughs> I'm not, I'm just flash back to the, I'm left-handed, so the earth is turning the opposite way. Okay. <laughs> but it's interesting, right? I mean, so there's my right hand. There's my left hand. You know, so is it? How is it? Now, this is also on a ledge like this that you look up at, right? So that hand, you know, could be, and it's so well preserved because it's protected, right, from the weathering, you know, it's like pointing out to that horizon. It doesn't look like it flat like this, but really you have to imagine this is on an overhang like this, right? And so that has relevance possibly to the way the, the hand. Um, this could be Venus in a crescent, much more common phenomenon, but why would you record it? Why wouldn't you see that everywhere, you know? So, you, you know, we have to feel into it with our intuition. I invite my walkers, my guided walkers, go on a guided walk with me to a six-sensory, six-directional awareness.
North, south, east, west, up, down, mm, some will say seven, within, right? With the, where you find your intuition. These are our ancestors too. They're human beings, right? Who built this as above, so below. They, 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 they watch the sky and th what they've left behind for us to have a look at really makes that connection. So I'm, 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 I, I like the idea of that being interpreted in that way of the supernova pictograph, but it's not sure. Yeah? Yes, ma'am. Um, when you were talking about the place that you study the most, which is the amphitheater. Yes. No, 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 it's just that, the, the, good question. Um, it, it, it's, it's playfully called the amphitheater. The, the Navajo call it <clears throat> Okay, that's, that's not even close. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I, I had the, the um, which means curved rock that speaks. Because I can take you to a place on the east end of the Bonito Chetro Kettle parking lot. You know, and I can, I, it turns out I can't take you off trail where the sound is amplified. Um, it, there's no seats, but it is that curved part of the rock. It's also curved in this dimension. So it has that amphitheater quality. There are places in it where the acoustics are very good. But I also found a place where the echo is very good. So for example, if this were out before me, and I call into it, you know, if it's an echo, it'd be like, you know, la, 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 la. Right? No, here's what it's like. Hello. Hello. How are you? How are you? Wow. It's that kind of gap. And, it, you know, and invariably people say, yeah, whatever, you know, and they go, what? Whoa. And it, it, there's this feeling that the rock, it's the voice is coming from in, within the rock. Right? And, it's, and it's a conversational gap in the echo. It's not, hello, hello, hello. It's, hello, hello. And then if I were to ask all of you to, you know, say one, two, three, chaco, which is what we tend to do, right? The beautiful thing is the fidelity is so good you would hear your individual voice as well as the collective. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's, it's crazy wonderful. And it's part of what is a singer, obviously, an astronomer together to be in that in-between place, the two largest great houses, the acoustic phenomenon, plus the horizons to the winter solstice, sunrise and sunset. This apparently empty space is full. It makes you coin the word empty full. Be right? Be because when you go to the place, you don't, we don't go to the in-between place. We, well, there's nothing there. It's the empty place. So we go to the building. We run to the building, right? We want to go to the thingness. When in fact, the space in between is actually culturally, naturally, absolutely full of wonders that we don't typically see or perceive, like those horizons, like that acoustic phenomenon, right? Like the rock art that's all over the walls there, the cavities that penetrate into the, there's all kinds of things that are in the unseen and that scream at us that it's about interconnection, it's about relationship, it's about interaction, not so much the thingness. And as a modern physicist, touch somebody, touch somebody, feel the solidity of somebody, right? I mean, be, be good, but just feel someone's solidness, feel this, this chair on your bum. You feel that solidity, that sense of material reality. This is good for your monks as well. <laughs> yeah, that sense, I, I, I want to, that sense of solidness that we experience on this scale of being is actually mostly empty space, the empty space between the atoms. Well, what giving us this experience of solidity? Well, it's the forces and interactions between and among the atoms and molecules, the electromagnetic forces. This is giving us the sense of a material solidness, but in fact, the reality is about the interaction. So this is what I'm doing in Chaco. I'm saying pre-modernity is screaming at us. It's all about the interactions, folks. It's about the empty space, the space in between. 
And post-modernity, quantum physics and atomic theory, right, is also telling us, hey, it's all about the interaction. It's all about the interconnection, folks. Moderns wake up to, to our interactions, our interdependencies. And then I do something really, I take a toilet paper tube and I say, if you're thinking like a Chacoan, you probably won't call this a tube or a cylinder, right, or a roll. You would more likely call it a relationship between two holes. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, I can feel it just sinking. <laughs> I want you never to go to the bathroom the same way again. <laughs> a relationship between two holes. Why not? Look around in your world and see where it is you could describe things as relationship. The door, the window, the cup. How can we value the empty space, the space in between? How can we learn to appreciate that what appears empty is actually full. Yeah. Should I leave you on that thought? Yeah. <laughs> okay.
like the stars we're born and die it's our light that carries Oh 